network security and penetration testing. In chapter number nine, we are going to talk about hacking network devices. There are lots of network devices. They play an important role in overall functionality of the network. Uh, they are required for the security as well as for confidentiality of the information and so on. Your authentication, uh, services to the users, uh, their access rights and all those things. We'll be, thinking, we'll be talking about that how they are usually hacked on the network. Now, the object objective of this chapter is to identify the vulnerabilities of proxy servers. So we'll see what are proxy servers, identify the vulnerabilities of routers and switches, and then the firewalls and virtual private networks. Now, this VPN is not the VPN that we use in order to hide our identity. This VPN is to connect point-to-point -point services. Now, proxy servers perform the following functions. Restrict the users from accessing specific websites using internet access rules. So if we have a proxy server, what it's doing is that it is allowing users for certain websites and blocking access to the users for other websites. Further, we can define categories in it that these are the categories for which users can access the websites. And these categories, they are not allowed to access the website. For example, if I want to block a category of gaming on proxy server, it would automatically list all the gaming websites, either updated by the update servers of the proxy appliance provider, or by the meta tag or the category of the website, it would automatically block all websites related to gaming. So we can use the categories as well as individual websites, which could be blocked on it. Mask the IP of the user's PCs within the network from the outside connections. Maybe the IP address that you are getting from the internet service provider for the organization is 52 dot something. But inside the network, it's your own IP range, whatever you would decide to have it over there. And the external network users won't be able to find your IP address within the network. Maintain the logs of the request and details of users that they are accessing the internet. So each and everything, whatever you do on the internet is being logged. What you access, which websites, for how long, um, uh, the details of the PCs, IP addresses, timings, each and everything is logged. Now those logs are usually maintained on the proxy servers depending for how long you have configured the logging interval. If it's uh, uh, configured for a month or six months or a year, depending on the capacity of the proxy servers, usually we maintain the logs for a longer period of time. Maintain a cache of the websites that users on the network have visited. As I discussed last time that if users are constantly visiting the organization's website, it would be cached on the proxy servers. Plus any other website that they are constantly accessing and they want to get some basic information about that, it would be cached on the proxy servers. So that every time when a user tries to request the same information, they don't have to go all the way to the internet and get the information. It would serve them from the cache. Now that's a typical behavior of a proxy server, which they are explaining that on the internet, this PC is connected. The only address seen by the web server is 10.23, whereas you have a proxy server and you can see the IP address over here has been changed for LAN as 192.168.0.1. Whereas on WAN, it was the same address as 10.23.17.25. So your inside users would have 192.168.1.100, 101, 103, depending what kind of network is it within the organization. So the IP address is completely different within the network as compared to the external network. 
A proxy server is simple to install. It's often part of the operating system of a server. And then you can add often included in router and firewall software. The user interacting via proxy server is hidden, but can be traced through the log stored on the proxy server. Now the category of attacks depends upon the proxy servers, attacks made through the proxy servers, and attacks made through proxy servers, including buffer overflow attacks, denial of service, or session hijacking. Now the concealed identity is a proxy servers hide a user's real identity so the external users won't be able to see the actual identity of the user. Hacker uses this model to perform hacking operations anonymously. Now hackers use this information to perform hacking operations is because since it's hiding the identity of the hacker, he would hide behind a proxy server or a group of proxy servers before they launch an attack. So they can have a user at one end, then he can have multiple proxies in between, and then from the last proxy, he'll be, he'll be exiting his network to enter a network of another organization. In that way, it's very difficult to find the actual IP address of the penetrator. Hacker's IP and time of the attack is, however, maintained on the proxy server, but you cannot do anything for that since he's constantly changing the IPs and the networks. Two ways to avoid the logging problem is hacker might use a chain of proxy servers. Hacker can spoof the valid authentication details of a network. Now, as you can see, a hacker is at one end and then he has first proxy, second proxy, third proxy, and then he's attacking the victim. So he's constantly trying to hide his identity. Telnet from the network to the network, through the internet, and it goes on. For example, categories of attack, they were talking about if he's using a username and password to logging into a proxy server using LE's credentials. So, the person who will be responsible for any kind of problems on the network would be Elise because her account was used in order to launch any kind of attacks because he somehow got access to his credentials and now he'll be using her account in order to penetrate on other computers on the same network. Now routers and switches. Routers and switches both segment a network and our most can filter the uh, packets. Now, both routers and switches are found in a normal network environment, mostly. Now, switches are considered to have a lower security than the routers, and switches are often viewed as the internal network component with the advent of VLANs, virtual LANs, technology on the switches, some networks are being designed with gateway switches. So the switches are performing the same operations in virtual LANs as the routers, because it's virtual. You can configure things and you can configure them as gateway switches. So the external network would be terminating on a VLAN, having an external IP and then converting it to an internal IP and then the packets would be flowing managed by the switches, which are on VLAN. Some networks are being designed with gateway switches. VLANs are a form of logical network segmentation. As you can see over here, we have two examples. On one side, we have standard switch network. On the other side, we have a VLAN network. Now here, for a standard switch network, we have internet connected to the router directly and then router is feeding the switches which are under it. So router is handling the IP address sequencing which would be followed under it. Now these switches are serving, for example, finance and executives and then the research and development department. On the other hand, we'll see the VLAN network, which is a virtual LAN. Internet is directly terminating on a VLAN switch and from there directly it is connecting to the users. 
So that's the benefit of using a virtual LAN. So we can avoid the routers in the middle. Now there are advantages and disadvantages of it. It's always better to have layers of protection. So if your users are terminating on the router first and then going to the switches, of course you'll have access control list and basic level of authentication and authorization. If somehow virtual LAN switch, which is a gateway as well, is compromised, the external users would have direct access to the internal network. But if your router is somehow compromised, but the switches are safe, he'll have to work hard to first bypass the router and then bypass the switches to reach the internal network. If the attacker has access to the console port of the router, he can easily set a remote user for the router or a switch. Default password for the Cisco routers is admin admin. You can see it on the book, but always it's changed. That's the first thing being an information security specialist. What you must be doing is to change all default passwords and to, and to disable all guests accounts which are there by default on these routers. Now router exploits are port scan are used to discover whether ports are open, what applications are using those ports, and then even the operating system of the system being scanned. Hackers can perform many attacks on routers and switches remotely. Some basic router attacks are denial of service, distributed denial of service, and router table modification. Denial of services, sending lots of request for the addresses which does not exist. Distributed denial of services, multiple computers would be performing the operation, overwhelming the overall performance of the remote server. And then the router table modification is to poison the routing tables with forged entries, which would take them to malicious websites. This is just an example of Nmap result of a D-Link router where you can change the modifications of it. Now router exploits, hacking router through telnetting. For example, a user would use, a hacker would use a telnet, which we discussed that it's the unsecure way of communicating with the devices since the username and password flows on a clear text on the network and it can be captured using Wireshark. So if someone is still using a telnet in order to connect to the router, they can capture the packets and use, uh, can know the username and password. Once they are logged into the router, they can get reach to the switches under it as well. Now we have firewalls. Firewalls plays an important role on the network, often considered the ultimate one point solution for securing the network. Because they are exposed directly to the external internet, the internet service which you are getting from any subscriber or from your other organization, they usually enter the organization and they terminate on the firewall. Now from both internal and external threats, maintain a function of, main function of a firewall is to centralize access control of the network by keeping an eye on both inbound and outbound traffic. Means that the firewall keeps an eye on the traffic which is coming in your organization and the traffic which is going out of your organization. Now if you have a proxy, if you have a exchange server in your organization through which users, external users would be accessing the emails, it means that the external users need an access to that exchange server within the organization. So you'll have to open the ports through which the external users will come to the exchange server within the organization and would be able to access the emails on their servers. Same goes for internal users. When they'll be accessing it, they'll be able to access the internet, or not the internet, the emails from within the network. Same goes from outside. If a user is sitting at home and they want to check their emails, they must have an access to reach the server, get the emails, uh, reply to the emails, and maintain the basic level of communication with that specific server. 
They centralize the access control of the network by keeping an eye on both inbound and outbound traffic, preventing unauthorized users and malicious code from entering the network. So it controls which users can access which IP addresses, which users can access the network from outside the network, which internal users can access the servers within the organization, the timings of it, the content, further firewalls, which are the next generation firewalls these days, we can have a function of a proxy server in it as well. We can block websites, we can block categories, and we can trace users who are trying to perform any kind of malicious activity on these firewalls. So these days, firewalls are very advanced to help us out in lots of different operations. Some firewalls can filter the packets on the application layer. Um, nowadays, as I'm talking about next generation firewalls, most of the next generation firewalls can perform this operation. Now, firewalls are designed to be transparent to authorized network users and a very intrusive to unauthorized users. So it keeps track of all the communication which is taking place. Now, there are certain limitations for the firewalls as well. Firewalls have limited ability to check data integrity that if there is any confidential information which is going out of the network, firewalls are not smart enough to get hold of it and stop it from moving out. Firewalls cannot filter packets that are not sent through them. So if a packet is, throwing, uh, is flowing between a communication of a team viewer session, you have allowed a communication or you are seeking help from your friend in order to do certain operations using TeamViewer, if a user is sending any file through TeamViewer, firewall cannot detect it. It cannot see the packets which are flowing inside. Firewalls from different vendors may not work well together. Firewalls do not provide robust support for application security. Firewalls do not provide a complete solution for stopping malicious code from entering the network. As I told you, if a user is using these tools to share the data, the code or the malicious files which are copied from the remote computer to the internal network, firewall will not be able to see that. The only way to control that is that if communication is taking place, you'll have to make sure that your internal antivirus is powerful enough to detect the malicious code and delete it as soon as it is saved or enters your network. It would be copied, but as soon as the file is copied, it would be deleted from the computer with a notification sent to the uh, main enterprise uh, antivirus solution manager that a file has been detected and it has been deleted from there. Now, other limitations are firewalls may not detect attacks if they are not configured properly. So you'll have to define that what is an attack. If a user or if the internet traffic which is coming in your organization for the internet purposes is only for that, that's fine. But you'll have to see if someone is trying to access multiple machines from outside to seek some information. Or if someone from outside is trying to scan your servers within an organization may be looking for possible open ports or trying to penetrate on those servers. Firewalls cannot detect hackers using a valid username and password. Uh, of course, if a user or if somehow the username and password of the uh, firewall is being leaked out, the hacker can access the firewall from outside the network using the same username and password. But then it's your responsibility to configure your username and password in a way that you'll have to define it on the firewall that this admin credentials must not be accessed from anywhere outside the network other than this specific PC, this IP address, and this MAC address. So that no one from the outside would be able to access the admin portal of the firewall. 
firewalls are effective only if security policies are established and enforced. Firewall attacks can be organized in three categories usually. The way they usually attack the firewalls is by spoofing, session hijacking, or denial of service. The basic methods to hack a firewall is through the back doors using Trojans, root access to have the admin level access to the firewall, and through the web if you have allowed that the users would be able to access the firewall from the web. Now, backdoors are an alternative method used by hackers to access the network. After an attack, attacker may leave an alternate route that can be used to hack the network again. Means if he used an account and he was successful, he might create an account on a category which does not seem like the users over there will have any elevated privileges. He'll create some accounts over there and he'll exit. So that next time, if he want to access it again, he won't use the admin account, but he'll use the account which has the same privileges as the admin account, but its name won't be admin. It would be a name which is a normal name of users within an organization. Two ways to restore a computer after an attack is to format the computer and reinstall the data. Get rid of everything, completely format a machine and install it. Of course, it would take some time. Fixing the bug used by the hacker to access the computer, it would take time to find the actual vulnerability on the PC before you'll restore it. The best way is to create an image or rather create healthy images of the computer and keep on updating them and make sure that the data which is there on the computers is being stored or backed up on a network drive somewhere. So in case of emergency, if they need to format the machine, they can easily do it by just deploying the new image and copy the data back from the network storage device. Using vari various techniques, a hacker can lure or fool a user into creating a backdoor to have an entry. Now the hacker is sitting, he's using Telnet or VPN user, hit an admin, password, and then he'll be accessing it, the computer using or bypassing the firewall. Now root access used when hackers want to return to the network and manipulate its data by using root or administrative access. Hackers attempt to gain this access by either using a backdoor or sniff the passwords. Or using some other programming code to hijack a session, hacker installs a rootkit that is used to variety of purposes. Rootkit can perform different operations automatically. Now he'll send a rootkit or a malicious code to a remote computer within the network using an email or by copying some files using the USB for example, if it was a contractor or anything just visiting an organization and they got access to a PC, he'll connect his USB, would copy the files on that. Whenever the computer is connected to the internet, it would automatically connect to the internet and would keep on sending the credentials through that. By using some programming code to hijack, hackers install a rootkit that is used for variety of purposes. As you can see, he can install something on the computer and will be able to access it from the Joe's computer. Now, through the web, hacker can break into a firewall through a web in many ways since the majority of the firewalls permit access to remote web servers. It is allowed, but you can disable it. Search engines can be used to find information about particular firewalls and firewall should be considered one piece of the multi-tier security solution to your organization. So if you have only firewall, don't consider yourself to be in a very safe environment. There are multiple layers of protection. What is a VPN? Virtual private network allows employees to access their company's network from a remote location. Using the internet as a transport vehicle, VPN accesses the protocols like point-to-point -point tunneling encryption of the data to send and receive the information on the network. So you'll set up a VPN so that your users will be able to connect to your network if they are outside the network. 
it could be through cisco it could be uh, point to point it could be using a third party tool there are lots of authentication mechanisms and communication mechanisms ipsec is usually used which is the internet protocol security in order to communicate between the two different networks it is usually configured using encryption keys so that the communication between your computer and the remote computer remains 100% secure. Now Joe's work computer is at one end. He's trying to access the VPN server which would give him access to the internal network. Now the threats through the VPN is attacks on a company's network through a VPN are often indirect because uh, if the username and password of a user is compromised, anyone can use his username and password in order to access the network, um, uh, the corporate network. There are always multiple layers of protection. Like you might have seen 2FA from Google, Google Authenticator. So once a user logs in, a code comes in terms of an SMS or if they are using an application like that, a code is generated, which has to be entered before the user is authenticated on the network. The attacker can acquire the necessary information. A VPN connection of a valid user can be used to perform the attacks on the network, including the denial of service, session hij hijacking, and spoofing. Basic steps to safeguard a VPN is to protect user home computer's physical environment. Do not use save function for the VPN password. So whenever a user wants to access a VPN, they'll have to enter the password. Install a host-based personal firewall on the remote computer and install a host-based intrusion detection system on a remote computer. So mostly what organizations are doing is that the users who need to access the corporate network from outside the network, they are issued official laptops or computers through which they'll be able to access and all those computers would have updated antivirus definitions and all the basic security protocols to secure them. Install an antivirus program, perform more than one level of security checks, audit the personal computers and the remote computers requires username and password to enter the network. Now that brings us to the end of the chapter.